Let's get started. Uh, we are all here. Um, good evening to Japan. Good early morning to Alaska and uh, Arizona. And uh, a wonderful time uh, in Boston and Buffalo. And we have, of course, uh, uh, in the, uh, Norway in Oslo. Uh, you're getting ready for dinner. Okay, good. Uh, welcome, everybody. Not quite yet. Some of us uh, um, have dinner at uh, more Central European times, not uh, not in the afternoon. <laughs> so, welcome, everybody. I also um, uh, want to greet everybody out there. We have 16 people right now. Those sessions, as you all know, are open. Uh, one thing we all hate as session organizers or speakers is session hoppings in the good old days when you get off the chair and open the door, close the doors. This is now not uh, uh, forbidden anymore. People like myself uh, hopping <laughs> sessions all the yeah, time. Yeah, you doing that, I'm sure. And nobody even uh, knows about it. So uh, <laughs> welcome, everybody. Uh, and I'm really, really happy that you were able to join under these very difficult circumstances. I want to also give a shout out to our uh, EAA Secretariat, Katka, you just saw, uh, and everybody on the board worked extremely hard to make that possible. Uh, and I think um, uh, it is a really big success to have at least once a year uh, an opportunity to talk about research or to talk about uh, uh, climate change and heritage, what we will do today. Uh, so my name is Peter Beal. I'm the chair of uh, uh, the Climate Change and Heritage Roundtable together with uh, uh, Wiebke van Drup martens and Elin uh, uh, Dahlen, both from NICU uh, in Oslo. I'm from the University of Buffalo. Mm, not quite right, Peter. Sorry. It, we haven't uh, gotten Elin to move her workplace. She's still working at the director oh, of Cultural oh, Heritage. Not sorry, sorry. It's early in the so, uh, <laughs> Anyway, so we will, we will introduce ourselves later on uh, when we do uh, the roundtable. Um, so a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Uh, we have our six panelists. Uh, we're waiting for Jeff uh, Altschul, uh, who uh, had some trouble the day before with his internet. I have his presentation, so we have that. Um, we tried always in these roundtables to have a, a, a wide range of uh, professional associations uh, uh, from around the world. And I will introduce everybody in a second. Uh, Jeff is joining right now. Um, we were also expected uh, to have Elizabeth Chilton. Uh, she is uh, the new chair of the uh, theology section uh, of the American Anthropological Association. And also Marcy Rockman. Uh, who is rep uh, was supposed to represent uh, ICOMOS. Um, so, but we have uh, Marcy Rockman's ICOMOS uh, presentation ready. And I asked anyways everybody to speak and uh, to prepare more like an oral statement because I was quite aware that there are all those techno uh, technological issues. So, uh, uh, so that's um, um, what I asked everybody to, uh, to do. Uh, let me just report, uh, I'm sure you have all received as members, because everybody who is here has to be a member. You have all received uh, the report of the communities. Um, it's about a three-page report, uh, which I don't want to uh, go through uh, in detail, uh, because it's very short this year. Uh, since Bern, um, we had uh, very, you know, beginning to think about what could we do. Uh, back was canceled. Uh, uh, SAA was cancelled, where we were supposed to have a session, and so on and so forth. Individual conferences were uh, cancelled. Uh, so the report is really that individuals of us did continue their work, uh, but as a community, uh, we were rather inactive in regard to uh, orga organizing uh, roundtables and so on and so forth. Um, I will get to that uh, later on. But the good news is. Uh, <clears throat> We have a tally, uh, how many members uh, all the uh, 20 communities have, and we are number three. So we get the bronze medal. We have over, uh, I think we have 57 members and uh, on our uh, community. Uh, and um, we have postings, we have a, a um, repository, and so on and so forth. So I'm quite happy about that. And we also, I found out yesterday night, um, from uh, the vice president that we have been uh, renewed 
So uh, we have been renewed officially another uh, three years, and we can talk about that also uh, a little bit uh, a little bit later. Uh, so what I thought we're going to do today, and uh, we discussed, we had a pre-meeting uh, with uh, Aileen and uh, and Vivke. Um, we do uh, we want to do two things. Uh, number one, as usual, we go around the table, the screen, uh, and uh, first starting with our professional organizations and just telling us what has been going on at your professional organization uh, in regard to climate change and heritage. Uh, and uh, this can be uh, done uh, in a way which kind of activities, initiatives, sessions, individual research, policy, funding, whatever you want. I also would like you to, uh, to, to talk a little bit about the challenges um, and uh, uh, I will talk personally also about that because in America and Jeff and uh, Ben and also Anne uh, can uh, echo that and can talk from your corners. Uh, uh, it seems to be that a lot of uh, uh, grant uh, funding organizations have also slowed down and postponed calls and so on and so forth. But we will hear from everybody. Uh, and then the second part is that we go around and I uh, we'll then ask everybody, um, I'm not sure whether I can invite actually uh, people uh, to uh, uh, the session, but we use the chat, I, I think, the chat uh, to, to ask questions for the panelists or also the chat uh, to, um, uh, to be able to, uh, uh, you know, present your institution and tell us a little bit about uh, what you do, where you do uh, see the challenges. Uh, uh, at the current time. Um, I would then uh, think that at the very end, so the last hour or so, we would like to spend um, uh, the time of this roundtable, and again, it's not a session, it's a roundtable. Um, we at least, Vipi, uh, uh, Elin, and I, we had this idea uh, that we would like you to ask uh, about what you think about the next step. Uh, what should we do better? What are we doing well? What could we do? And we had one idea, the three of us, is um, thinking about um, uh, something which connects us all. And we all do very good work individually, writing grants, uh, doing surveys, uh, uh, teaching, and so on and so forth. But what has been missing is an overall structure, a grant, which could look like the DISCO project. Uh, EAA members here know about the DISCO project. It's a long-term project uh, uh, showing uh, with European funding and basically was a result of showing us or giving us an idea what each individual uh, European country is doing in regard to professional archaeology. So, um, and that was just like what the, uh, three of, uh, the three of us were thinking. Could we maybe think in getting something together on a structural uh, basis and on a policy and not so much our individual research, but thinking about that we take stock, what is out there? What could we do in order to bring all those organizations and institutions and individuals together and with an outcome a little bit like this very successful DISCO project? So with that said, that is basically what we thought we, um, uh, we um, how we would structure, but again, it's a round table, uh, especially after we go around uh, um, and giving our uh, short statements. Uh, it's open for discussion, and please do uh, use uh, uh, the chat box here on the right side, and I will monitor uh, the, uh, uh, the chat box, so uh, I will bring those questions and uh, all up to you. Um, without further ado, I would say uh, let's get started, and maybe get started with uh, because we not that Kochi is falling asleep later on <laughs> because it's already like 11.30 p.m. in Japan. Well, I don't why don't worry we, about that. <laughs> why don't we start with Kochi and then we go to the uh, SAA uh, and then we go to the uh, AIA and then we go to uh, ICOMOS uh, and then we go to a very new, uh, not that new anymore, but an amazing new coalition, Sivas uh, 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 and Jeff Archer. Okay? Good. Kochi, take it okay. on. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, from uh, late evening Japan. Um, as you know, uh, work uh, has uh, postponed 
or meeting, which was to uh, have happened by now, in which uh, we want to have a number of sessions directly concerning uh, climate change and the global change and uh, other very pressing related topics. And we had hoped uh, to have uh, at least a um, uh, couple or more uh, uh, sort of pro uh, propositions for work to adopt uh, as formal policies to come out. Uh, tabled uh, for uh, approval in our uh, uh, meeting uh, designated towards the end of our uh, Congress. But um, now it um, uh, has to be postponed for one year. So we are now focusing on uh, doing uh, something one by one. We catch our later uh, in the form of uh, issuing statements. Uh, we have had already a couple of um, statements uh, concerning uh, climate change and global change, one of which uh, was our statement on Amazon fires, uh, which um, we did uh, uh, last um, March. It had already been a while uh, since uh, that uh, ongoing disaster uh, caught the eyes of the world in the form of the um, uh, widely uh, reported um, uh, incidents uh, of um, killing of an indigenous people uh, uh, in relation to the destruction of the forest uh, by fire. So um, we uh, uh, had a fact-finding mission, albeit virtually, uh, to our colleagues in Brazil and um, somewhere uh, uh, in the Amazon area. And then we issued a statement. Uh, that was one thing which we did, uh, which was directly related to uh, climate change. We were also approached by uh, Brazilian members uh, uh, about uh, uh, their uh, current administration's policy uh, uh, of discouraging any activity from any uh, academic um, uh, schools to uh, stand up against their uh, policy of de facto allowing uh, the uh, firing of the forest. Uh, we are still working on uh, uh, the um, uh, statement, but then it will uh, come through uh, shortly. That will also address uh, issues concerning uh, climate uh, change uh, as a part uh, of it. Uh, uh, that uh, what we are doing that is uh, in direct um, relation to uh, uh, climate uh, change uh, initiative. But um, hopefully uh, next year, if we are to meet in uh, person, uh, we will have uh, a, a number uh, of um, statement to be issued from uh, WAC nine. Uh, which are to be directly related uh, to, to climate change issues. And I'm pretty sure that um, some of you uh, uh, might be involved in one of these sessions, uh, which have already been accepted uh, to WAC9. So um, uh, WAC9 will be a, a substantial opportunity uh, for us to express our not only concerns, but then try to disseminate our message in a concrete and substantial way. That is what I can report from the work side. Thank you. Thank you, Koji. Peter, you need to turn on your mic again. The, the, the famous Zoom, hey, muted, right? I mean, it's just... <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, clearly, um, uh, I think Vipka will present uh, at, uh, we'll have a session at back. And uh, is there any way, uh, are there, is there still an open call for new sessions or is it only that the old sessions will? Um, we will do sometime uh, uh, towards the end of September and early October for a set uh, number of sessions uh, uh, to be submitted and um, accepted. Although um, the number wise, uh, the program has pretty much uh, filled up. So it's up to uh, uh, how many sessions uh, will 
drop out uh, of the schedule that will determine us uh, how many additional sessions to be allowed. But um, there is still some room for sure. So um, please uh, keep your eye on our website uh, where we will advertise uh, some additional uh, call, for, uh, call for sessions. Okay, sure. Good. Good. Yeah. And uh, also, um, is, there, is there already planning going on for a, uh, for a virtual meeting or a hybrid meeting? Hybrid, uh, perhaps, uh, because um, two uh, uh, congresses ago, we had a proposal of um, shifting uh, to that mode already. But um, back then, we didn't have any technology backing up that idea. So um, we have been putting uh, that idea on hold. But um, we realize it may be high time for us to uh, uh, make work to be partially uh, online, whereby to uh, cancel out uh, our carbon uh, footprint for those of us who have to travel a uh, uh, long way. Yeah, so um, we uh, that is uh, certainly uh, on our agenda too. Excellent. Any other questions for uh, for Kochi from the from the chat? Please, uh, we do uh, because again, it's a roundtable. Uh, please um, uh, type in your questions when you listen to a speaker, uh, and then I can ask the speaker right away. And then afterwards, when you open the floor for all of you. Uh, again, uh, please use the uh, uh, chat uh, and also the panelists. You can ask yourself questions. So, uh, anybody else on the panel uh, wants to comment or ask uh, Kochi a question? Vika? Uh, yes, so thank you again, Kochi. Um, and it was sad that we had to cancel, but that was for obvious reasons. Uh, uh, and uh, let's just hope that it will be possible to have a physical meeting next year. Uh, and, um, I think there might also still be some openings in some of the sessions. I'm not sure. That's right, yeah. Um, yeah. Perhaps in, the, in the region of um, 10 or, or something, but um, perhaps um, less than uh, 20. Uh, mm -hmm. But then we still uh, set aside some room for additional uh, session proposals, which will yes. um, uh, take place um, uh, sometime between the end of September uh, throughout October. So uh, please keep your eye on our website. Will do. And uh, for those of you who are interested, uh, it's uh, Sarah A.S. Rigby and Ellie Graham uh, and myself who are arranging a session called Strange Enough climate change and heritage. Fantastic. Yeah. And uh, in, in case some of the speakers, uh, uh, Vipya, of this particular session drop out, um, is, is that also a, lo uh, a lower level? Is it uh, Can session organizers also fill spots, or is it only on the session level? Uh, fill the spot, perhaps. Yeah, uh, still. Perhaps. We are uh, trying to be very flexible. OK. Yeah. Good, excellent. Okay. Anne, thank you, Kochi. Anne. Okay, right. Okay. Um, all right. Mike should be on. All right. There's a couple of things in here I'm going to kind of hop over because I think Marcy probably is going to cover them or you will cover them for Marcy. Um, we've been pretty active, uh, I would say, CSAR members, which some of which overlap with, with members of this committee fairly heavily, as well as others, um, have done a lot of session organizing. There was a uh, um, uh, full full day session actually at Inqua last year, um, and so I know several members presented. On my actually had to be done by proxy because I was in the field. Um, you know there was obviously the community we mentioned the community change roundtable. Obviously we know about that, but we also had a lot of participation in a climate change session at the last year's Canadian archaeological meetings. Um, and we were going to have two sessions, spot, actually two sponsored sessions at, at the SAAs this year. Uh, there was going to be a poster session entitled Beyond Triage, Prioritizing Responses to Climate Change Impacts on Archaeological Resources. And then we were going to have a companion forum, um, the old it's worth saving, how can we prioritize when we can't save them all? Obviously, we're somewhat concerned about prioritization, I would say. Um, the system, at least in the U.S., is not... You know, it's 
it's still very much driven by people doing research proposals and uh, there's no consideration given to the the issues you know if you're choosing between two proposals whether a site is going to vanish in two years or is going to be there for the next you know 50 uh doesn't seem to be you know isn't something that has been factored in and a lot of us are concerned about that because it's 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 been a you know it was sort of a tentative park service practice here in the u.s and most others follow them that you preserved everything in place and it's only now that they're starting to realize that say in alaska that's not really preserving things in place it's more like letting them rot in place um you know because you're going from essentially perfect preservation down to soft tissue to you know what you get most in the rest of the world i mean i used to work in the mid-atlantic where you get literally uh yeah if it's not recent it's you know just um stone tools um so um anyway so we are going to have to re reschedule those sessions we've actually submitted them recently and i think most of the the same presenters are going to be able to participate the committee's going to meet virtually itself uh they gave us several options and we picked the virtual one because that way it doesn't really matter if the meetings happen or not um and we're also looking at ways to hold the sessions virtually uh several several of the members have actually volunteered their university zoom uh you know as hosts if necessary peter being one of them um because you know we just can't can't pause things forever waiting for for saa to get themselves together to provide a basis um so uh there's let's see a couple of members uh, adam markham and uh, marcy we're chapter lead authors for an ICAMAS report called The Future of Our Past, Engaging Cultural Heritage and Climate Action. So they're really trying to push uh, attention to cultural heritage into the sort of broader climate uh, change uh, response sphere, because it's it's been pretty neglected, both the effects of climate change on cultural heritage and also what uh, archaeology can tell us that might actually be useful for uh, adapting to at least climate change so several other people were were reviewers of various drafts and um adam has organized a piloting of a new climate vulnerability index so um that's that's kind of a good thing um tim kohler another one of our members has is a lead author one of the lead authors for the north american chapter of the, the sixth annual assessment or sixth assessment report of the ipcc um and he's working on a uh manuscript with marcy and tense about the ipcc for archaeologists so hopefully that'll be forthcoming um there's been a lot of a lot of work uh around um community i guess i say community citizen science uh maine uh virginia um and obviously florida and california are, are all pretty active and we're still working on alaska um there's uh, a new citizen science app actually for Virginia that's being piloted by by uh, volunteers for the Archaeological Society of Virginia. Obviously, this is modeled on the far more advanced European models, <laughs> you know, escape and citizen and whatever. Um, you know, people are, now there's there's it's a little harder in the United States because the cultural the site locations are protected uh, information in the United States, unlike in Europe. Uh, they literally cannot be revealed under a Freedom of Information Act request. And you can get darn near anything under a FOIA request if you can you know, back it up. But they are literally by law exempt from that it, because of looting is basically the issue. Um, you know, there's been various ways people have gotten around it. Um, the folks in Florida have been uh, using cemeteries kind of as a proxy for a lot of sites because cemeteries are location of cemeteries is not protected. So, so they can talk about them on the web. Um, I mean, they actually ran into an issue with the Florida Shippo because they had a site that was showing up on their, their material. Now, this site had a rest area, a visitor center, signage on the highway telling you, you know, go to the site, um, big parking lots, the whole nine yards. I mean, it was interpreted, you know, like, Scarabray, whatever, just think of any site in your country. And they were still, they still had an issue. The ship still had an issue with them having the location of that site on their maps, despite the fact that you could find it on any map produced by the state of Florida. So, um, you know, there's obviously some challenges. Um, so, uh, obviously, 
Vivica has been pretty active and she'll probably mention more about it. Um, we have been able to set up uh, Facebook and Twitter pages. They haven't been particularly active because I haven't really been able to get um, a lot of assistance in, um, in uh, moderating and whatnot. But the idea is to be able to get out information quickly to the community and uh, also as a place for people who may want to seek quick advice. There's a Historic Preservation Facebook page that, you know, I think is a, is a good model for that. Um, we're trying to build, we're building a big collection of documents and links to sites. I mean, I've got all this stuff, you know, stored. And we're trying to get SAA to approve a static web page or pages on their, uh, on their website. Um, so that people can access this and we're trying to have it be not a members only but an outward facing thing there's you know both for the public and also there's a lot of archaeologists who due to various unfortunatenesses within the saa and i would say kind of trip ups by some of the leadership um, are no longer um interested in being members so they wouldn't be able to access the website even though they are still practicing archaeologists so um, the idea is to, to get that. That hasn't, as far as I can tell, actually had board approval because everything slowed down. We were making good progress till COVID. Um, I've been working a lot actually with permafrost people. Um, I'm actually co-PI on two permafrost projects, trying to bring um, realization that there's cultural heritage that's disappearing with permafrost, not just infrastructure uh, of the classical sort. Um, so I'm, I, you know, I'm working on that. I'm also working on my colleagues in Alaska because, uh, yeah, they, they still are kind of, I, I think they're almost paralyzed by, by the enormity of the problem, but um, I'm helping to organize the, the Alaska Anthropological Association meeting for next year, which is going to be fully virtual. And we will have a session. <laughs> we will have a session if I have to. Um, so anyway, I think that's, that's kind of a wrap you know, we haven't been as active as we could be uh, because of COVID. You know, it stopped a lot of stuff. And I know a lot of people's research has been stalled uh, here in Alaska. You know, villages don't want um, people coming in from outside. Uh, since all my funding runs through the University of Alaska Fairbanks, I can't go to any community off the road system, even though I live in one off the road system, um, you know, with, with university grant funding. So um, that's that's just pretty much it. Um, because they're really, really trying to avoid being the people that bring it to the, some village and, you know, kill a lot of people. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's SAA. Hopefully. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, this is really uh, amazing that we are still seeing so much work and I can, I can share with you our uh, vice president and president for research just published, uh, or we had a zoom meeting with the leadership and he said, well, our research expenditure uh, means uh, the writing, whether we get whether we get the grants or not, um, increased twenty percent. So, um, unfortunately, there are also you know like uh, positive aspects of uh, COVID that people seem to have more time to write up things, and I would like to spend some time later on, uh, especially on this uh, research. But um, so, um, uh, Anne, you know, if the SAA. If they don't want to host you with all your information and links, uh, well, we have the community uh, repository. Yeah, it, it just occurred to uh, me earlier, <laughs> earlier in this call, is like, hmm, you know, maybe. We no, so, so Marcy, Marcy is actually, very active. So, and you have a, you if you you have access, you can post yourself uh, in the repository, uh, or if you don't want to do that, send it to me, and I'm posting it. And this is really like so important. And we've just put uh, uh, some publications out here. Uh, uh, you can click and then have download. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, these are the new things we should really use. And I do believe the idea of the community is uh, to make us bigger than we are in our uh, institution and even in our professional organization. So uh, please do check out uh, 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 the community um, the community website and repository. And if somebody posts something, you all get an automatic uh, message. Uh, then you know you can go and upload and look at it and all that. So, uh, so please use that uh, um, uh, that uh, uh, tool which comes with your with, uh, with your membership. Any uh, any questions for for Anne? Yeah, um, Anne. This yeah. is Jeff, uh, and I'm gonna try to turn on my video, but I may freeze. But um, the um, 
one of the things, you know, in the United States, obviously, we're facing an, an election. And uh, I, I know that uh, it's not premature that, you know, if, if, uh, if the Trump administration is reelected, then I think the, uh, you know, we, we understand what that looks for, looks like for climate change. If, uh, yeah. if Biden is able to uh, win, it would provide an opportunity to have a different discussion about um, how um, deal with some of the issues affecting both heritage and, and long-term social change. And uh, I just wonder if it's, you know, for the SAA, for you guys to work with the Government Affairs Committee to come up with a, an agenda now that might, um, you might have a better chance with um, um, getting it implemented if we, if we are active now. That, that's all I have to say. Thanks. Yeah, fair point. Um, I will reach out to other committee members in, in government affairs and see what can be done. Yep. Excellent. Good. And if, if you need any, if you need any backup from uh, around the world, just holler out, and uh, we'd be glad to help you out. Excellent. Okay, uh, Ben. Yeah, yeah. You're muted. Okay. I think I'm unmuted now. Um, well, first of all, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the AIA, I would like to thank the organizers of the roundtable, Peter, Elin, and Vipka, for inviting us again to this discussion. Um, the year since Bern has been one of transitions for the AIA. Uh, we have welcomed in a new president, uh, Letitia LaFollette, who's at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. We have a new executive director, who uh, I think two weeks into her job uh, had to shut down the office. And so we've been uh, working remotely uh, since March. Uh, and we are in the middle of creating a new strategic plan for the AIA in which uh, climate change is uh, and social justice are topics that are going to be uh, considered uh, by the board as they create this new strategic plan that will take us uh, through the next five years. Uh, the changes uh, in our programs, of course, are... Uh, pandemic related changes. Uh, we are our, our annual meeting, which is to be in Chicago in 2021 will now be virtual. A lot of our programs, many of which are in person have to be changed. I guess an unintended but not negative consequence of the pandemic has been that we have gotten a lot greener. Our lecture program, which sends 100 lecturers out uh, is now all virtual. So uh, we have reduced our carbon signature, and in fact, the money that we would normally spend on uh, sending them out, the travel costs have all been transferred to helping all our societies to get uh, Zoom licenses and upgrade Zoom licenses so they can make the lecture program more accessible. So that actually has been a little bit of a benefit, and societies are now thinking of themselves as not just geographically uh, circumspect, circumspect, but in fact are opening up to not just other AIA members, but people in general who can now log in and, and, and listen to these uh, scholars. Uh, I'm going to read a short statement that the AIA, uh, from the AIA, and then I'll be happy to take uh, questions if anyone has any. The AIA would like to reaffirm its commitment to promoting sustainable and ethical archaeology that uncovers and illuminates the past while respecting the realities and challenges of the present day. The Institute continues to make changes to its 140 year old structure and operations that acknowledge and address current issues like climate change and social injustice. These actions include, but are not limited to supporting through our grants and fellowships, new technologies and research that minimize impact on archeological sites and the environmental context in which they exist. Uh, by supporting archeological site preservation that creates long-term sustainable site management and conservation by reducing our carbon footprint, by encouraging the widespread use of digital resources and publications, by converting traditionally in-person events to, vir to virtual ones, uh, and by including topics of sustainability and social injustice in our annual meetings, special webinars, events, and our lecture program. 
uh, and finally by advocating for a sustainable future through our publications, websites, and social media platforms that reach millions of people each year. The AIA is committed to expanding these efforts and through participation in sessions like this one, we hope to be an even better informed partner and ally to our colleagues who continue to work towards confronting and solving the issues of climate change's impact on archeological heritage. Um, that, so again, on behalf of the AIA, thank you for inviting us. Thank you for making us part of this conversation. Uh, and like I, well, I, I'm here mostly to listen and to see how uh, we can be of assistance. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Oh, I'm, I'm mute. No, I'm not mute. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Uh, um, and um, I, if I may say, if I start off here, um, I'm not sure about VAC and I'm not sure about uh, uh, the SAA, but uh, your statement you just uh, read um, seems to be uh, very uh, powerful. And uh, so is that is that really official? Uh, is that on the website or is that... Um, is that how do you deal with statements like that? And what, what what were the, it was not necessarily just focused on climate change, but how do we as organizations um, uh, feature and highlight our values in form of policy, mission statement, vision statement? We had yesterday, for instance, if some of you were at the, um, uh, at the business meeting, uh, we had a, a very good discussion, but at the very end, uh, for technical reasons, it wasn't adopted. Uh, we have a new EAA policy statement on gender, equality, diversity, and protection, right? It's like a, uh, what is it, a four-page, five-page, six-page six uh, uh, statement. And uh, um, so, and it's very difficult because you have, we are membership, a membership organization, and if somebody votes no, and especially in a virtual uh, environment, it was not possible for us really to adopt it. So, Ben, could you talk us through where that statement, how that statement came about, and is it on the website, or what are the um, what are the plans with the statement? So, the statement that I just read to you was actually one that was crafted purely for this session and for the EAA's purposes, because you asked us to uh, yes. participate and to give a statement. We have actually just sort of written this for for that purpose now. Vivka, to your question, can we share the statement? I will certainly take the statement back to uh, the executive committee who is meeting actually in a, in a week or so, and we will, uh, we and I will bring it up with them to see uh, how they feel about that. I, my feeling is that maybe with a few edits, it'll be it'll be available, but that is uh, a decision that I, I will encourage them to sort of make a decision on that. Um, are, of course, for us right now, uh, in fact, uh, because of the situation, uh, not just the pandemic related issues, but with with the sort of the social issues that you're seeing in the US currently, uh, a lot of our thinking and commitment has been towards addressing uh, social injustice. So the biggest statement that we have made uh, most recently with other institutions, uh, with other organizations, uh, and that's on our website, addresses that issue of social injustice. Uh, the executive committee and our board felt that that was the focus right now. They have uh, uh, they have put together a task group uh, to, to discuss what the AIA can do uh, going forward uh, and how we will, uh, how we can connect with other organizations. Because we have this sort of hybrid audience of both professional members and hybrid uh, and lay members, uh, we have to address both audiences, and currently the first steps that AIA has taken has been to address that professional audience. Uh, their first step in that was creating a series of webinars that has been that have been talking about uh, the historicity of race and racial relations and the uh, topics and, and talking about things like decolonizing uh, the classics. Uh, <clears throat> and so it's been a series of webinars for the professional audience. Uh, I think the most recent of which was, but I think uh, uh, this past Thursday, uh, which had I think over 500 people who had uh, uh, registered to to uh, to discuss the topic now or to hear from the panelists. 
Uh, our next step, and this is what we're considering now, and we will be considering in the next few uh, months, is how we as an organization respond to what is currently happening and how we coordinate with other organizations. And so that's what we are exploring right now. AIA uh, it moves slowly. Uh, and so despite the urging of some of us to, to act uh, in a more expedient manner, uh, of course, we have to sort of get these gears going. And our hope is that uh, the, the, in the fall, we will be addressing this on a more um, present day level, as opposed to uh, sort of this ancient, uh, talking about the ancient, uh, we're talking about the classics and, uh, you know, the, the, the discipline as such. Uh, so that, that's, that's where we are right now. We are actively considering this. Uh, there has been a call to uh, reach out to other groups like the SAA, EA, WAC, uh, ASOR, and all these groups to come together uh, to have this conversation uh, in a more sort of holistic way, uh, addressing the needs of all organizations because we're all confronting the same things uh, or very similar issues, I should say. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Uh, any comments or questions from the panel or from uh, our audience? Deepka? If nobody else has, then I'd like to say, uh, well, yes, I think that it's really important that you're engaging so much in social injustice now because, I mean, watching CNN every day is like uh, waking up to a nightmare. Um, and it's like the worst uh, reality show on earth uh, going on every day. And it's, uh, it's not something... Uh, some crazy mind invented. This is actually happening, and uh, and these are issues that need to be dealt with now and can't be ignored. Um, so, <clears throat> fingers crossed for November third. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Any other uh, comments or questions? Um, okay, then what you just said is important, and uh, and. I'm jumping a little bit here, um, but I definitely want to say it now that everybody uh, can think about it, uh, um, is that if an, initiatives, an initiative on the level of what you just mentioned, that AIA will reach out to the organizations, we have to make sure that we, as a community uh, of the EAA, is consulted. This is now internal, but I think it's it's uh, it definitely at the EAA, but I think at other organizations as well, who's actually talking. How is information filtered down to, quote, unquote, uh, the lobby group, the specialists, or whatever? Or is it staying on the executive board and decisions are made without consultation? And uh, I do believe the, uh, the uh, ideas of the communities our president had, Filippo Criado Boado, was exactly that, to break that down and to make more bottom-up policy. That means if the AIA hopefully will reach out to the EAA, this will actually uh, be sent to, uh, or we uh, as a community will be consulted as well. I think that's really important, especially on in the time. Um, and I'm hopeful uh, of a post, uh, not only COVID, but also post-Trump time. Uh, that uh, we can again think of on the global level and making those connections because that's how we become stronger and that's how we get informed not just in our country and in our region uh, and uh, but uh, globally and I think this is uh, an important point and we have to really uh, think about policy and I will talk about that a little bit later uh, but I just want to make that point. Um, we have here questions. Thank you for your talk, Ben, to everybody. Can we therefore imagine such a big conference to take place uh, in a live way again and have a high CO2 impact again, for example, by flying to the conference? Or are we supposed to keep on meeting virtually uh, even after the pandemic for the environmental and social reasons? Um, hey, uh, wonderful point. Uh, I let the panel answer. I just can't answer as a university administrator, um, you know, it's we have to think, especially about archaeology and anthropology, um, that is really a dangerous situation where you are in right now, that you have to argue not only for each conference in the post-pandemic you have to go to, uh, but even fieldwork. 
uh, you want to go where travel is involved. So I do believe we have to be, especially in our field-oriented uh, uh, research, uh, uh, be very, very careful uh, that administrators uh, at the local universities are not cutting, because that's an easy cut, the, the travel or keep the travel budget zero as it is right now. But um, comments, uh, Ben, or anybody else on that question? Yeah, I just uh, put it in the chat as well. I mean, you know, this this is has been an eye-opening experience for all of us, uh, and certainly for the AIA. Uh, you know, we are seriously talking about how we move forward. Uh, and as I said, we are already considering things like board meetings, executive committee meetings, these in-person meetings, changing them to um, to more uh, virtual events. But of course, things like our lecture program, which is our physical connection between our lecturers and the audience and the society members, those are harder to do. And so we are trying to figure that out. Uh, but even, uh, even so, our, our general conversation has been about hybridizing almost everything that we do. And even, uh, which will of course minimize or, or help to lessen our environmental impact. But also I think one of the things that we're really, really concerned about is accessibility and making sure that what we do is accessible to all. And I think that hybridization, that's the one thing that we have uh, discovered is that it really does uh, increase our audience and it makes our, our uh, information available to people who cannot physically get to meetings, who cannot travel to certain spaces, you know? So, uh, 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 so that that is something that we are talking about, of course, uh, no decisions have been made. There are, there are very practical impacts to uh, decreasing in-person events, uh, revenue being one of them. Uh, and so that is also that also has to be considered. Everything has to be balanced. And so we'll see as we go forward. But like I said, we are in the process of creating a new strategic plan for the next five to 10 years. Uh, and this is a serious uh, part of the discussion. Any Anybody else wants to chip in? Anne and then Vipya? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I actually virtually uh, gave a paper, I think, at last, last year's meeting in the decarbonizing archaeology session, um, where I pointed out sort of <laughs> kind of remote. I think most of the session was actually kind of done by remote, um, but we cobbled it together ourselves, and it could have been way better, judging by this year. Uh, but, you know, I did point out that there are certain issues with uh, disadvantaged communities, you know, who don't already have the networking capability. There are issues for those who are at small institutions where they're the only archaeologist. You know, there's not a big department, um, you know, connections, so on and so forth. So we need to, I think that we, we definitely need to have the hybrid thing, but I think we need to also think about not just the sessions, but, but how to uh, replicate some of those other uh, things that people get out or we're going to, you know, be disadvantaging, disadvantaging um, people who are not, you know, the dominant ethnic group and the, you know, well already, you know, educated and come from families who are educated, you know, first generation scholars and, and people who are remote. The other thing, of course, is that, you know, I have probably, you know, I have the best bandwidth you can get here in town and you would not believe what I pay for it. Um, it's not cheap. Um, you probably all have better connections than I do. And I bet you don't pay half of what I do. Um, so Maybe except you're Jeff, probably right? getting five to six times the minimum what I have. Okay. So, and this is only probably working because everybody else in town is still in bed. Um, you know, so, uh, that, that, that's always a kind of an issue. So, um, you know, that, that should be taken a little bit into account, but I, on the other hand, I can't go to a meeting without flying a minimum of a thousand miles there and back. You know, that's assuming it's in Fairbanks, which is the closest place to me that anybody ever has meetings. So, you know, um, virtual is a good thing uh, in general. Uh, so, but I think a hybrid model and, and actually setting up, you know, there was much song and dance and wailing from SAA this about this next one and actually about the past one about setting up any kind of AV assistance or virtual stuff. And, you know, oh, we can't do Zoom and this and that and the other thing. And, you know, I subscribe to Zoom personally and can host a hundred people and I pay that out of pocket. So I can't, you know, if the SAA can't pony up for something slightly larger, it can't be that much more. I mean, really, you know, I, I, well, I can, I can tell you just for all of you, because I see that most of you were not at the uh, business meeting. Um, so you can take that back and those numbers are public. Uh, so this year costs $30,000 uh, euro, uh, the hop in. 
this conference uh, just like the uh, software uh, 30,000 uh, 30, euros. Uh, but yeah. you're not running uh, a hall. You're not doing a, you know, I mean, obviously they, the SAA has contracts years out and so they have to go with them, but, yeah. but you know, there's, there's, you know, there's lots of expenses to hosting a conference, you know, moving all that stuff, moving the staff, paying for the hall, uh, you know, you go on and on and on. I mean, yeah, you know, $30,000 or even a hundred thousand dollars is probably way right. cheaper. Uh, yes. Um, Sorry, I just got a small distraction here. Uh, but uh, yes, I think that uh, Mari also commented in the chat that that uh, uh, virtual events don't mean less income necessarily, uh, and because of of all these. Uh, I mean, you can also charge uh, for this. I know that the EA chose not to charge anything for this. Uh, uh, conference for those who are already members, just the membership fee. Uh, but you could have uh, have charged a fee for uh, for participating um, uh, in a virtual conference as well. Um, but uh, but also um, to uh, You're breaking up. Mm. Maybe I jump in uh, the cat. Maybe <laughs> uh, so we jump in here. Um, so we shouldn't, I, I, I don't want to get stuck uh, too much about the conference. Uh, uh, just let me tell you, I threw out one thing there, and that is archaeology is not just, uh, you know, the conferences are not just coming together and present research. We support local mm -hmm. uh, economies. And uh, there was a question about how normally, uh, uh, what does it cost to organize a conference? And, I cannot tell you this way because there's so much back and forth in regard to what we bring in regard to sponsorship. But please let me remind you one thing. Um, and that's what I see a danger. And I mentioned it was fieldwork. But um, I can also tell you that uh, excursions for me personally, but for so many members, and I know that from my work on the executive board, were crucial to come to the EAA conference. And we are archaeologists, and if you really go and see, not virtually, uh, 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 a site which is under threat uh, in regard to we talk about climate change and heritage, or a beautiful uh, uh, um, uh, open air site, I mean, all of that, we have to think about that because that, mm. if we are just going virtual, that is just going away. And then, and I'm sure Jeff will talk about it later on, is the question. Do we actually need to excavate anymore because we have already so much data out there? And then you get, in, in my opinion, in this vicious, vicious circle where administrators um, uh, are saying, and whether it's local universities or politicians say, uh, don't let a uh, um, don't let a good uh, a crisis go without any good changes, right? I mean, uh, crises can be used to rethink, especially what the core of our profession is, and that's materiality. And we are talking here now also about virtuality, but our core is materiality. And that is really something we have to uh, think about. So um, if we could just move on uh, and uh, uh, because again, I do believe we all are surprised about the effectiveness uh, of those uh, conferences, uh, virtual conference, um, uh, the positive effects they have in regard to uh, carbon footprint in regard to budgets, which can be then used, like Ben said so nicely, for other things. Um, but uh, uh, again, it comes in and starts with equity uh, and access. Yeah. And so uh, that is really not okay that Anne has to pay out of pocket uh, to, to do her profession. So um, just like to say that. And we can come back to it, because I also will talk about Kiel, which has climate change as one of the main topics, and I need to get your input on that. Okay, thank you very much. If there are no more questions uh, for Ben, uh, then I would move over to um, uh, to uh, Marcy, right? And uh, um, if we could pull that up and you double click, you know that now, you double click on the present, uh, on the on the screen, then you have, then you can read it. Uh, Vipka, you want to present it? You just want to read through oh, it? Um, just, uh, just a sec. I, I'm just opening it, so uh, to full screen presentation. So I will share it with you in just a 
second. I only have one hand now, so. Uh, okay, quickly. Uh, so, Mary, Mary, so I cannot, we cannot answer that question in regard. You can look at the budget figures, which are in the uh, 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 in the TEA, in the European Archaeologists, uh, where you see figures, but at the very end, uh, you know, there's no clear cut how much does it cost uh, uh, a meeting, um, because it's, uh, it's a really very complex uh, 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 budgeting uh, there. Okay, uh, you want to you want to walk us through, um, um, Lipke? Okay, you're frozen again, Lipke. Is it frozen? Yeah, you're back. You're back. Maybe yeah. Turn off the video. Okay. Maybe okay. Okay. Um... If you double click uh, the presentation, it'll double in size, so it's easier for you to watch. Um, so uh, uh, this is then uh, Marcy Rockman's presentation uh, with the update on the climate, culture, heritage, and the IPCC project. C chip. <laughs> I like that. I just need to get it to move to the next slide, which is seem to want to do uh, while we're waiting for it to switch to the next slide which apparently takes a while uh, I am just uh, going to alert you all to the fact that uh, this uh, roundtable session is also being recorded uh, just like the sessions uh, we asked that specifically, though they had said they wouldn't report the roundtable, so that we would be able to share this with those who couldn't be here. Uh, this is really, really annoying. Uh, I don't know what happened to the PowerPoint. There we are. And now we got two more, so. Um, so the goals of this C chip was to host an IPCC co-sponsored expert meeting on cultural uh, heritage and climate change, and then assess the state of knowledge on connections of culture, heritage, and climate, and uh, to use all that uh, as a catalyst for new partnerships and work, and uh, potentially including a special report on culture, heritage, and climate. And uh, as we can see here, the partners are ECOMOS, uh, UNESCO, IUCN, uh, ICLEI, uh, and uh, the Facilitative uh, Working Group of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNI Local Communities and Indigenous Peoples Platform. And the scientific questions uh, were then uh, about uh, the systemic Actions of culture, heritage, and climate change. Uh, indigenous ways of knowing, Western approaches to science, climate change itself has a history as do all communities. Um, the second one, cultural govern governance, who decides what heritage is and how is heritage knowledge managed. Um, the third one, loss, damage, and adaptation for culture and heritage. Vulnerability, significance, prioritization, adaptive preservation methods and the capacity to learn from the past uh, using data knowledge from the past and climate models and policy, uh, finding common ground between climate and heritage approaches to research questions. And the fifth uh, scientific question is then the roles of uh, culture and heritage in transformative change and alternative sustainable futures. The capacity of historic buildings and landscapes to hold carbon and heritage as inspiration. Sorry, I can't even read this because it's covering this stupid bit is covering the screen. Um, so uh, uh, probably we will be able to share this PowerPoint with you later on the repository as well. We just need to double check with Marcy, uh, but uh, then you can read the full text. Uh, but the IPCC said yes on uh, June 18th. 
so uh, there will now be a scientific steering committee uh, identifying 50 to 75 global representatives uh, for the meeting. Uh, they will then commission a series of white papers to assess of knowledge around the five scientific questions. There will be a series of preparatory online events uh, in the first half of 2021. And uh, a meeting is anticipated to be held online uh, in the middle of next year. And uh, that was it from Marcy. Uh, you want me to leave this on or should I just close it again? No, close it again. And um, um, we can go back on. Thank you. Uh, any uh, any questions uh, or com uh, questions uh, comments? Um, maybe I start. I, I do believe that you see that uh, e-commerce is very active, and uh, Kochi was just at a meeting there as well. And I also can report that I was at a um, social science panel for climate change, um, and uh, I think that was two years ago. It was reported, and, and the white paper came out uh, out of that. And I, I tell you. I'm sure you're all on academia and research gate and so on and so forth. But that paper, um, that white paper, uh, has been you know cited so many times that I really do believe that everybody should be very active uh, on that level, on the policy level. And uh, so Marcy is our representative there. Uh, if you have any questions, um, and I will write to Marcy, I'm sure, because she has constantly posted uh, on uh, the rep uh, rep uh, repository uh, that she's happy to not only have uh, this uh, uh, PowerPoint there, uh, but also to be a point person uh, to connect the e-commerce uh, and climate change initiative uh, with us here. So again, I can all of you working individually or on those uh, um, uh, in associations, uh, policy and being on those committees, being co-authors of the of white papers. I know it's a lot of work. Uh, uh, I've done it. But it's really worth it. It's really worth it. And uh, that's where I want to come at the very end of this session, a more uh, structural approach. How can we be more impactful in regard to climate change and, uh, and heritage? OK, any, um, uh, that sounds great news. Uh, yes, Marie, that I really think this is uh, terrific. And so sorry that Marcy uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't be here uh, today. Any comments, uh, any other comments to uh, Ikamas? I think Elin is also working with the ECOMAS uh, question. But maybe we've lost her. No, there she is. I'm, I'm here. Yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. Good. Um, yes. Um, the, uh, connected to the World Heritage, it's, um, it's already a policy document on the impacts of climate actions on world heritage properties that was adopted um, in 2007 and this policy is now uh, on an update uh, there is a group working with the update and um, um, and the, the new policy well it's it's uh, an ongoing work so we don't know all about that yet but um, uh, I think they will try to take into consideration the Paris Agreement and other climate and uh, heritage related multilateral agreements, processes and instruments, including the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the 2015 Sunday Framework on Disaster Risk Reduction and the 2016 New Urban Agenda and um, the 2020 Global bio, Biodiversity Framework. So things are going on. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for the report, the reporting out. Any other comments uh, to Ikomas? What was the, uh, Kochi, when you were saying that it wasn't related to climate change, when you were saying you had an Ikomas meeting? Uh, you are, you're muted. The meeting I was involved was the uh, meeting to uh, approve the idea of having a virtual uh, annual 
Congress of Wicomos. So um, uh, that was the first time for the history of Wicomos uh, to have it um, approved, I think. So uh, it itself <laughs> was incidentally perhaps the first step for Wicomos to become uh, environmentally friendly, I think. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, good. Uh, no uh, more uh, uh, questions uh, about uh, the in the chat. So, um, Deepka, if you could load uh, um, Jeff's uh, presentation, and Jeff can walk us through. It's a PowerPoint. It's a uh, PDF. Jeff, uh, are you with us? I'm here. Can you? Okay. Can you yeah. Okay. Okay, at some point, I want to have everybody on screen because I want to do a screenshot, OK? <laughs> OK, yeah. so we are switching off our videos now. And Jeff, the floor is yours. OK. OK, well, uh, thanks, everybody. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, a relatively new organization called the uh, Coalition for Archaeological Synthesis. Uh, can we get the next slide? OK, so this is uh, the coalition is only a couple of years old, started in 2017, and it basically is is a uh, confluence of a couple of things that happened. One is, uh, personally, um, I was uh, the uh, I was in cultural heritage management all my career. And uh, that was, you know, we, we, we did that work under the premise that uh, we were doing something useful. And uh, it wasn't just about saving sites. And it wasn't just about learning particular set a particular archaeology around a project, and that we actually could contribute to larger issues. But um, over time, the the practice of CRM, in particularly in the United States, became very project based, and so there was very little incentive to try and bring all those data together. Um, I think the statistics in, in, in Europe and North America are similar. They're, they're somewhere on the order of 20,000 field projects done in the United States every year. And my guess is that's reasonably close to Europe. There's close to um, three to 4,000 excavations done every year under CRM in the United States. And, and my guess is that's not that different. And of course, when we talk, it's one thing to talk about North America and Europe, but it's transforming the entire discipline. It's all over Asia, Africa, Latin America. Um, so we have a tremendous amount of data that we had not been doing much more than learning about particular projects. And so that was what we wanted to leverage all the money the public had spent on archaeology into something bigger. And uh, and we also fought, felt strongly that we should be able to enter the debate and address issues that um, affected the public, such things as climate change. And so uh, the coalition was started. The coalition is partner organizations. They're 47, they're, they're somewhere between 45 and 50 of them around the world, from China to Latin America to everywhere. And uh, we, in addition to organizations like the EAA, the SAA, departments of anthropology and, and uh, museums and NGOs, uh, we also uh, have associates, which are individuals who can become part of the coalition. Uh, partners pay a small amount associates are free. And uh, we also, so the coalition is a coalition of partners, of, of, in, of groups. And we wanted to have, because we wanted to work on issues dealing with 
social challenges. We wanted to have the results resonate outside of our discipline, particularly into public policy. And so we decided that the best way to do that was to partner the coalition, which is a bottom-up kind of organization, with a, an administrative uh, uh, center at a university. And, and that university, uh, we put it out to bid, the University of Colorado at Boulder is, is, has successfully set up the Center for Collaborative Synthesis and Archaeology, and there's a memorandum of understanding about how the coalition of partners works with the center and who, what the responsibilities are. Okay, the next slide, please. Um, so we work on various themes. We I wanted to to list a couple. Um, we, uh, we have funded several projects, one on biodiversity, one on fire management, and, and we did one that the EAA and the SAA sponsored on human migration. We are putting together a project right now on social inequality that uh, we hope to get funded, and it will start actually in Kiel next year. And then we had a committee of our partners uh, put together the issues that they felt needed to be addressed with archeological, uh, that could be addressed with archeological inf uh, information and uh, that, you know, sort of ranked in terms of what is important. Um, and so you see them here, they're climate change, colonialism, food securities, so on and so forth. Um, and I want to make sure everyone understands that, you know, what we're trying to do is, is identify themes, but we will then be sending out to partners and associates to look at those themes, look at the types of questions we think can be addressed with them, and then add on to that. So this is not a complete list, um, nor is it done, the whole idea is that this become inclusive. The next slide, please. Okay, so, you know, we're talking here in a round table on climate change. Climate change actually for me is a tough one to address because it is so embedded in everything else. And also for us, we, wanted, we want to discuss aspects of problems that other sciences uh, don't address as well as we do, and for which we are uniquely um, positioned to do so. And so if we were to come up with a statement about, you know, people should, um, you know, uh, uh, not eat, burn fossil fuels or should adapt to their environment and be in harmony with it, those kinds of statements don't translate to public policy. And they're often better stated by our sister social scientists in sociology or demography or, or, or some other um, science. So it's not, we need uh, to work at problems that, you know, have long-term issues. Uh, uh, things that it's not just the proximate cause, but, what's gonna happen in 50 years? What are the unintended consequences that societies face when they make drastic changes in how they relate to each other and with their nat natural environment? And how do you anticipate those kinds of things? So we have three projects that are related in some way to climate. The first was the archeoecology project, which came out of Australia. Australia is, as many of you know, facing the single most mass extinction event in, uh, well, in the last few millions of years. And so it is a government policy in Australia to increase biodiversity. 
And so there's been a lot of work on biodiversity. And now what we funded at CFAS was a project to look at biodiversity worldwide, six different case studies, and come up with policy recommendations that different governments could think about. Or And uh, so that's being done. That's led by Stephanie Crabtree. And it's in, in affiliation with the Santa Fe Institute, which is also a partner. And uh, the second one is interesting because it deals with fire management. And in the United States, and I think around the world, fire management, the increase in fires, their intensity, their uh, uh, just devastation, um, it, you know, that that is... You know, Koji talked about the Amazon. Uh, it's a huge issue. We did a project or we sponsored a project uh, out of um, the border lakes region of the United States and Canada. And uh, it, we thought, or I thought naively, that this would have a climate signal to it. The reason there are more intense, bigger fires uh, is because of, at least partly because of climate. Actually, it turns out that the climate signal is very weak. And what, what drives the intensity of fires in that region is some, it, it all relates to what, what happened in the mid 19th century called the Dawes Act, where native peoples were removed from the landscape. And so the whole notion of wilderness, uh, land untrampled by man is, uh, you know, it's a very American concept. It doesn't exist uh, pretty much anywhere in the world. And this was interesting because this project came from the Forest Services of the United States and Canada. They needed a evidence-based research that showed what best uh, fire management uh, policies were, particularly for areas called wilderness. And so that's been a, a collaboration with First Nations, uh, dendroclimatologists, managers, and I think there's an archaeologist or two on it. But honestly, that one was driven by CRM work, but it's been, that work is now being leveraged by other uh, disciplines. And so for me, that's a very interesting thing that uh, our work is of importance to other people. And then the last one I'm gonna talk about is the uh, climate related migration. Here we're focused on indigenous groups and the whole notion of, uh, you know, the, the expectation in the next, throughout the, the 21st century is that you know, there will be a billion people on the move between now and the end of the century. Um, disproportionately, climate change will affect indigenous peoples. Um, and even though they're only 5% of the world, they represent 15% of the most of the poorest people in the world. And so they generally, it's hard to generalize, but, but many of those groups are very closely aligned to their ancestral lands and would like to stay there. And it seems that as archaeologists, it would be a good thing for us to uh, help them to think about the kinds of issues that they will face. You know, the climate models are pretty clear in particular regions. What are they going to, what are small scale farmers or pastoralists going to face? And how have they dealt with it within their cultural repertoire? And uh, not tell them how, what they should do or recommend what they should do, but uh, provide them with information from which they can make decisions. So that's that. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, so... What can we talk, what can we say about climate change? I, I just wanna say a couple things. One is for me, reading a lot, uh, reading on the issue and, and being involved in it for, for a decade or so, there seem to be two lanes that, uh, well, there's really only one lane 
that's open to us, and that's the heritage lane. I think as long as people say, you know, the effects of climate change on historic and archaeological properties, that's that's within our bailiwick. That's our, you know, we should focus on on preserving things or thinking about how to preserve things. But it's very hard to get people to recognize that archaeology, that there are long-term social processes involved. You, I, I have, uh, I think like a lot of you, I've been in discussions where people say, you know, really the world's different now. It's a global world, uh, society is different, things in the past don't relate well to uh, uh, what's happening today. And I think, you know, the world is different. It is, you know, there, there's no question about some of that. On the other hand, there are social processes at play that um, are invisible or difficult to discern with uh, contemporary or shallow historic data that we as archaeologists may be in a, if not a unique position, in a good position to allow into the public debate about how we, how different communities should think about things like resilience or uh, how they just think about making decisions. The, and, and so I think the other thing is that we work to our strengths. You know, if we're, if archaeology is going to come up with recommendations that other scientists can do, say, the same or, and with better data and stronger uh, statements, those aren't our questions. Uh, we need to find and hone our research to those aspects of society that others just don't reach. And then we need to embrace our interdisciplinary heritage. The fact is that uh, we CFAS is based on a collaborative research model. And I'm, I'm not going to talk about that today, but the whole idea of team science and making, making science inclusive is at the center of what we're trying to do. This, this comes out of the ecological and environmental sciences uh, where they developed things called synthesis centers in, in the early 90s. And uh, we're late to the game, but uh, one of the advantages of being late is that we can uh, hone this uh, and, and modify our things to things that haven't worked out so well for these other centers or, and, and adopt those that have worked out really well. Um, and then we, we have to collaborate with local indigenous and descendant communities as, as true collaborators, as opposed to people we interview and talk to. Um, so designing research, um, that, that needs to be, we need to be able to listen to what is the questions they want answered, as opposed to decide what we think they, the questions are. Um, next slide, I, and I think the only thing the next slide tells you is that I'd like you to join the coalition. You can go to that website and uh, as a associate, you just click on associate and sign up and take about five minutes, no, two minutes. And uh, that's free. You'll get opportunities to join research teams, to, to learn about the results of the work, to be able to participate in, in, pro, in, in thinking about what projects to take on. And, uh, you know, as, if you have a partner organization, you can become a partner and uh, be part of the discussion about where, where synthesis goes in the future for archaeology. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, excellent. Um, uh, if you, yes, we are all, we can come all back. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, so uh, I, I only can chip in, uh, uh, like uh, Vipya says, uh, it takes only one minute. I'm privileged to, to work with Jeff uh, um, on this uh, uh, um, coalition. And uh, it's, it's, it's just not important, not, not just for me, 
uh, it's important for my students. It's important uh, uh, for their friends. And it is important really on a way which we, I do believe, especially in climate change research, we have to think, we have to break down. Uh, and I remember yesterday, uh, Jeff, if I can mention that, uh, when um, Mark Altendorfer was talking about why the uh, NSF grant was not successful. And uh, the answer was that some commentaries said, well, maybe that's not, that shouldn't go to NSF archaeology. And we all know when we work on climate change, we always, where do we, where do we, do you want to talk about that, Jeff? Uh, uh, no, but I think that uh, it was instructive. It, it wasn't, you know, we tend, uh, because of, you know, we hear in the United States so much about climate change that's just wrong from our government, we have a sense that the public is is the hard, is the group that's going to be hard to convince. When it turns out that scientists also are, are really skeptical about um, what we do, and, and, uh, and even archaeologists, um, the idea that archaeology is there to do something uh, uh, that our research should impact contemporary issues is not something that's shared necessarily widely within our discipline. Um, and that was reflected, as you say, on the NSF panel that, you know, uh, in that case, it was a grant institution that basically said, we're here for archaeology and we're not really here to solve the world, save the world. That That's not our deal. And uh, it was instructive to hear that from archaeologists. A absolutely. And uh, for our other non-American uh, audience here, NSF National Science Foundation. Uh, but uh, I can report that also from the ERC. I can, I'm sure, Kochi, uh, in, 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 in Asia, you have the same thing. Climate change, like Jeff so eloquently said, is everywhere. I mean, it really, in all projects, it, uh, and that is really something important. And, and, you know, we have to, climate change and heritage is at the very, very core, uh, what the future of, at least a large part of the future of our work, uh, um, we can really uh, convince the public about that because I mean that's really that hits home climate change hits home heritage hits home and but we are not alone here and that's why I just uh, um, uh, uh, put this uh, UL you can download this white paper uh, where I truly learned archaeology is just a part of the problem so what we also have to do is work with other social scientists and Jeff you mentioned them the sociologists uh, the economist, uh, uh, the geologist, uh, uh, geographer, and, and you, you name it. And this paper uh, really was very, very instructive to me that climate change is not only everywhere in archaeology, but it's beyond that. And most powerful if we work really uh, with other, uh, with other um, scientists uh, as well. Um, any comments or questions? Uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're now signing up quickly uh, to the coalition. Uh, the website is there. Uh, in addition to that, any questions for or comments for, for Jeff? Anne? Well, I'm wondering maybe a different directorate. Um, there's the, the geosciences now seems to have swallowed polar programs, but they actually have a program called Navigating the New Arctic, which obviously doesn't help you if you don't work in the Arctic, but it's much broader. Um, it actually almost mandates indigenous communities. Um, it lets you actually look at this kind of thing. I mean, I'm on, as I you know, said earlier, I'm actually a, a co-PI in a couple of projects that are primarily driven by permafrost. Um, but we're looking at the changes and impacts of permafrost change, climate-driven permafrost change, and in one case, coastal erosion on on societies, you know, what's it doing to the community? And that goes from infrastructure, everything that one of them, the co the lead, the PI is actually a, a structural engineer who specializes in foundations um, at Penn State. Uh, but, you know, there's me wearing sort of my anthropology hat. I mean, I was trained in a very far field department and I've always worked in a place with a, you know, indigenous uh, descendant community. So I've never really drawn a strict line between archeology span and you know, ethnography or whatever you want to call it. 
Um, but there is there is space some places, and they have lots more money than the social science directorates do. I think that's part of the problem. Um, you know, sometimes you just have to go to a new director. Everybody that worked in the Arctic that was applying to NSF, we all gave up on applying to the archaeology program because we always got that, oh, that's not our thing, or, oh, you've got the Arctic polar programs. You know, don't go bother yeah. us and take our money. Yeah. So maybe the, the, the thing is just to, okay, fine, archaeology doesn't want to play, see who would play. There's a bunch of, and they often have calls, and they, some of them are very connected to climate change. And, and, and the one thing you kind of that I, I would also say about archaeology's place in, in climate change and the public is actually when you can demonstrate uh, effects of climate change in the past repeated. So we had a huge flood here in 1963. Um, and it moved a lot of things away. And people tend to want to treat that as a one-off. The only thing is we've, you know, in the work at, at various sites, particularly Newbook, we've actually found previous instances of monster storm surge flooding that has been really bad. I mean, we had this at Butak House where there was all this nice wood pieces of all sorts of stuff still there. Um, you know, obviously the people didn't come back and get it. So they probably died, um, you know, in three to four thousand or three to four hundred AD, you know, and so you can start to show people it's like, hey, this is not the first of 63 is not a one off. This is something that has happened repeatedly. We need to think about it for our town because, you know, it's it's yeah. it's something we just need to be prepared for. And and that actually gets through to people in a way that that all of the talk, you know, and the, the climate change talk and the sea level rise, well, you know, yeah, they're, they're, but it's so gradual. It's incremental. They don't people don't get it. But when you can show them like yeah this is this you know really bad stuff has happened to people in the past here you know it's been and you can usually find analogs i mean to what's going on maybe not um you know full on but you can find performing you can find cooling you can find you just need to find your right analog and you and you know you tell that story to people as far as the public i mean some other scientists yeah they're hopeless but whatever um, okay. But the public can actually be very engaged, and I think that's that's actually kind of an important thing that that we can do. Um, yep. Thank you. Uh, uh, any other uh, questions, Vip? Uh, uh, one sec. Uh, uh, any other questions from the audience? And I think I can also, if you rather have, if you want to be live and ask your question instead of typing it in. I can actually get you on the stage because we still have here, uh, I think nine is the maximum. We still have two slots and I could also, um, you know, throw somebody out <laughs> and bring that person back in. So you have two possibilities. Uh, do please ask your question either in the chat or just ask uh, to be uh, let in here on this panel. And I click the magic button so that you appear here in this uh, distinguished group and can ask your question face to face. Uh, Vipke. Yes, I just wanted to like to add to to the whole debate that uh, at least the Research Council of Norway had to focus really uh, seriously on the interdisciplinary work, and they are only granting funds to people who work interdisciplinarily with heritage and with the with the natural sciences to work on climate change. So. Uh, so at least uh, that is one thing. And I also wanted to point out that we now only have 22 minutes left of our slot, even though Katka said that we could continue further than that, but Peter said he has to leave anyway. Uh, so if we were to start discussing uh, uh, the possibilities of future uh, research cooperation, maybe we should start doing that soon. But I don't want to keep off anybody who wanted to have comments or ask questions. So please just go ahead and do that. Thank you. Um, yes, and to lead over, uh, because I don't see anything on the chat right now, uh, and uh, I'm not sure whether we're getting cut off directly at uh, um, the recording might stop, but uh, I still can hang out a little bit if uh, you guys, but, uh, and I think this is the last session of the day, but um, so we are not so rushed, but um, let me just, from the back uh, end. Uh, in Kiel next year, inshallah, um, we can see each other uh, at a real meeting. There's a discussion to have a hybrid uh, version of it. That means people who cannot uh, uh, come, don't have funds, that they can actually do what we do right now. 
uh, this is in discussion right now. But one thing which is not in discussion is that one topic is climate change. And uh, so uh, I would like to uh, make that really uh, that you think about uh, here, uh, whether organizing a session, uh, we will have this round table again, but think about sessions, uh, think about paper presentations, and think about that you are representatives of many, many people in your network. Uh, that as soon as the call for papers is out, and as soon as uh, the climate change topic is formulated, and I will definitely also use the community uh, to send you that, uh, please go ahead and really spread it out. Because I do believe that uh, we have a shot here uh, in regard, especially in Kiel, um, at a coastal site, uh, at uh, an institute which has become uh, one of the top institutes uh, in, uh, in, in, in Europe, uh, with a lot of resources, especially in the hard sciences, uh, do please then try to get, um, uh, get uh, uh, the message spread so that we can have sessions, presentations, and uh, also uh, the roundtable uh, in a different, uh, in a different uh, uh, format. Um, I, second, I would like, um, and this is not enough time, of course, uh, to do that, uh, but also we discussed that briefly, uh, and I will continue discussing it with offline with uh, Elin and Wiebke. I do believe, especially because Kiel is coming up, um, we do need to work on a policy statement in regard to climate change. And I do believe this is the best group uh, to get these ideas, to get feedback. And so what you can expect in the next couple of months uh, from us, um, a, a draft policy uh, for uh, a policy statement on climate change and heritage, uh, which we do not have. We have the abstract of uh, our uh, community, but I do believe we need a little bit what Ben was uh, so, so nicely making this statement. And Ben, please get us the text because I think we can use quite a lot of uh, what is in this really uh, thought through statement. Um, so I, we would send that to you and for comments, okay? Uh, in regard to policy, we don't have a quorum or something like that. We, we are community. We don't you know, need to go through any uh, any quorum or whatever, but we get that from you. And then the next way would be to send that to the executive board in the spring. And uh, the normal meeting is about uh, um, March and I'm uh, the chair of the Oscar Montelius Foundation. I'm normally participating, even if it's only virtually. Uh, so uh, that is really an action item which I would like to come out uh, for you that um, we are waiting for Ben, because I think it was very nicely done, uh, that he sends us uh, uh, the statement of the AIA, and then Wiebke, Eileen, and I, we scavenging it and go through it and, and, and really get something uh, shorter uh, um, to you for your comments, okay? And we would very much like uh, to get your uh, feedback on that. So that would be uh, for the uh, EAA. Um, I. I would also bring that point in the last uh, 20 minutes or so uh, back to you, uh, whether, what do you think about, um, before we're looking for grants, you know, like uh, calls for, uh, for, uh, uh, for grants, I want to first hear your ideas about uh, the disco of climate change and heritage, means um, getting a grant where we go around the world uh, clearly focusing on, on, on Europe, because that's where we, uh, our organization is uh, located. Uh, but also archaeologists from around the world working in Europe or having an understanding of European archaeology, uh, whether that would be possible to create something as disco of climate change and heritage. Bochi, you wanna, you're nodding, you want to say something about that? You have to... Unmute yourself, please. Yep. Yep. No. You're, you're still mute. You're still mute, Gochi. Okay. 
Right. <laughs> Speaking of disco, uh, it had a certain impact not only uh, on um, European colleagues, but also Asia, uh, where um, we find it um, very important to, to know ourselves or something like that. So uh, it's um, quite an impactful um, uh, project. Uh, uh, so um, the similar thing, uh, if um, uh, realized uh, in climate change and its impact, uh, on uh, indigenous community heritage and um, uh, communities in the past. That would be uh, uh, very good. So um, I hope um, it's going to be covering the world rather than in Europe. Although um, I should say that um, uh, you can start from Europe uh, to test out what kind of a format uh, would be best suited and then expand it um, to uh, the global scale. But um, certainly, uh, that kind of attempt would be uh, very educational uh, for us securities, but also uh, the excerpts uh, of the outcomes uh, disseminated to the general public uh, would be also very impactful. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Somebody else? Any other comments? Please. So, Peter, are, are you thinking of asking, uh, so, uh, uh, applying for uh, ERC grant or something? Uh, to I, yes. So basically, what uh, um, you know, what I believe is um, okay. Uh, I think it's great. The community. We are three years now. Um, and we have just been renewed. And I saw always with Wiebke and Eileen, uh, this as a start to get talking, to get going, to get reports from your organizations, from individual members. Uh, our Scottish uh, uh, colleagues with uh, Marie and, and uh, Tom Dawson, very active always. Um, so people coming to those roundtables and presenting their incredibly important projects okay i mean this is just like that's the core of it but i think now we take stock and we should think about what are we doing the next three years how can we use quote unquote better use the community to get impact and i'm a strong believer in grants if you have a grant if you have it's not about the money. It is a structure. It is a, uh, the reporting. It is the milestones. It is getting people writing parts and commitment. And so I do very much believe that ERC is the best way to do mm. that. Mm. And uh, with the European focus, but ERC and Horizon 2020 is now also allowing to have subcontractors from around the world. And that's where I see, for instance, uh, CFAS as an, an opportunity uh, uh, to really enable with, uh, uh, with a new center in uh, University of Colorado. Uh, and Jeff, we cannot see his camera, but I, I did not talk to him about that. This is surprising, I'm sure, for him as well. Um, so I do believe that we can make that happen. And, mm. and then having a structure where people are coming together and the impact will be enormous just to see where are we in regard to yes. climate change and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and heritage in all those different parts of the world. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it might be early days to say, but then if you really decide to go for it, and then um, uh, if you use uh, WAC9 uh, next year uh, as a platform to launch it, uh, you can uh, 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 kind of propose a resolution and if it were uh, to be adopted, uh, that would um, uh, uh, mandate the uh, next executive uh, to uh, implement that in one way or the other. So and if you put um, uh, something like um, uh, ask WAC uh, to get involved in uh, uh, surveying or data corrections, by using our national representatives and um, local uh, regional representatives, uh, it would be nice uh, for work executive to implement it in a uh, concrete and a big way 
rather than have the seeing uh, that is happening and then we ask uh, to get involved so um, that's a very concrete uh, proposal but um, if you decide to go for it uh, just uh, go for proposing resolution uh, in Rock 9 and I think this is excellent because we have seen how successful it was for DISCO and then mm. to adopt, you know, to have the EAA as a uh, kind of mantle organization. And I could see that with VAC, I could see that with SAA. Uh, AIA, I'm not sure because, uh, you know, there is this kind of professional organization also with the lay, but we have to see that. Um, and then again, Jeff, if you could, you know, share your thoughts about that, how uh, CVAS uh, could be then, um, uh, you know, a part of that as well. Well, you know, Peter, uh, one of the issues that, uh, you know, I, I used to, uh, I formerly was president of the SAA, and one of the problems with a major organization is, uh, you know, they're a lot like big ocean liners. They're hard to steer. And so, SAA, EAA came together because they both wanted to address human migration. It's not easy for them to do things like special conferences. So by having partners in professional organizations that can use the coalition, because they are the coalition, to address issues of concern for them, so I would encourage the AIA, the SHA, and, and others, um, EAA, that want to address aspects of, you know, they have a special issue on climate change, whatever that is. Um, the coalition can be, can facilitate that probably easier than, than the organization can. Yeah. Uh, you know, that, that's just the reality. Good. Um, any, um, yeah, uh, uh, Marie, uh, very important here, the link to the uh, new climate action plan 2020-25, uh, which we launched in February. Please check that out. I've seen it. It's really cool. Um, okay, uh, Caroline, uh, we just talked about how the climate change debate is core cool to work in archaeology and beyond. The uh, conferences such as EAA hold climate change as a core and primary theme rather uh, than another specialist session. Yes, um, Caroline, I don't know when you joined us uh, um, to make that clear again. Kiel, uh, basically also Bern had a climate change uh, uh, theme. Uh, so that was there. And Kiel, Kiel the University, uh, the Kiel, the uh, conference organizer uh, of Kiel University uh, next year, they have also a theme. Don't ask me, even as a two-term executive board member, how important that is or not. Um, we, I, I mean, I never, and we never had a strategic discussion about that, uh, but your point is well taken. Um, are the themes just to get funding and sponsors and all that, or are they really, uh, used in the scientific, and I've been men, on many scientific boards, uh, whether we look whether those um, sessions fit into those themes, I think we are not yet clear on that. But it's definitely a discussion I'm happy, I'm happy to have with Johannes Müller, the main organizer uh, of uh, Kiel and C, uh, how, that, um, uh, how that shapes out. But your point is well taken, um, whether uh, a whole conference is on climate change uh, under a theme, or whether it's just uh, you know specialist sessions or round tables. Uh, my gut feeling is it will be always like a, a sub uh, a sub uh, um, session theme or whatever, uh, because you know there are so many other interests in those uh, uh, conferences uh, which we cannot just uh, and that makes those conferences so for me personally so interesting because I want to hear other things than just climate change, I have to say. I've, I've been at many sessions. Uh, I was at the reindeer sessions, you know, reindeer. You know, I mean, that's something which I normally don't really have exposure to. And that is what, for me, this uh, 
um, is so interesting. And of course, there is a climate aspect on this session on reindeer, right? I mean, of course, but uh, so, uh, but point well taken. Any other, um, you know, comments, uh, suggestions, questions? Deepka? Yes, I just had to unmute myself. Um, I would just uh, like to stress the fact that it's really important that this community is active uh, also between the yearly meetings. Uh, and uh, so far we've been active individually, but I think that we can reach much further when we work together. Uh, and uh, I was at the communities assembly on Tuesday and uh, the A now has a new uh, 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 social media uh, person um, employed, uh, Winscott, and he said that all the communities should have um, a Facebook page and a Twitter uh, account. And uh, Peter and Neil now are just like, yeah, I'm just going to be that. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, for that to make sense, there has to be constant activity. And it doesn't have to be from the whole community, but it can be from the individual members. And if there are 57 of us, then it should be possible to to feed something too. But I think we, the three of us agree that this will have to be the job of Win Scott to actually uh, uh, feed these, uh, but, but we can provide the links to him. Uh, but uh, but that also just means yeah I'll, I'll let you talk on just in a few secs. It just means that you something that could be uh, put on on this uh, either Twitter feed or the Facebook uh, for this community. Just uh, let us know, and uh, and we'll make sure it gets there. Anne? Yeah, well, we're not limited to having to generate our own content. I mean, one thing about both Facebook and Twitter is that you can repost things so that if there are things that are pertinent to what we think our, you know, readership or our goal would be, you can always just repost them ever with or without comments as, as, as appropriate. Uh, you know, so it's, it's not, you know, it's not just you have to think up something and be creating massive amounts of content and putting it out there. Um, and you will probably get some commentary occasionally. So somebody does, you do have to have a moderator because um, otherwise you'll get doofy questions. Um, you know, and maybe he can do that. Maybe he can't. Um, but, you know, I think it's doable. And you, if you can get a couple people to moderate, um, that's kind of what I'm working on for SAA. But, um, you know, just having kind of a couple of personal um, you know, Facebook pages for various projects and, and, and Twitter and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, it's not horrendous um, to do, and but it does probably help if the person who's doing it knows something about the topic. You know, I mean, he may be great with social media, but the question is, does he actually know about climate change and heritage? You know, if, if he's yeah. going to be responsible. For that's, that, that's a good point, and I'm sure you all if you're on Twitter, you have seen the impact of our mm. uh, new social media person. It's great. I mean, I love it. Uh, I really find myself reading, uh, you know, having a cup of coffee and see, oh, I, I would never have found this uh, megalith uh, new tomb in, uh, in Scotland or whatever. So, uh, great. But there is so much that person is really drawing on. And we just don't have enough yet. Uh, and that's what I want to say in the next few years and basically in this year to, towards Kiel because clearly writing such a big grant is not a thing which you do on the site. Uh, uh, you know, I would say if we would have in Kiel, uh, you know, a very good idea uh, about where to apply, how to apply, who is in and a structure, that would be already an amazing job uh, for such a large group. So I... I'm happy uh, with social media, but for us, it's not enough there yet. Mm. So at the moment, you know, if you look what we have, re the repository and all that, it's basically you guys and, and Marcy, the people who are on the panel, they put stuff in. The com and that's not our fault. That is the community has not yet taken off in regard to 
what is the, what is it actually for? You still have uh, the EAA here, the Oscar Montelius Foundation there, the EJA here, and the themes and you know, the public case. So it's not yet clear, and that's mm -hmm. why with 57 members, we are number three, um, what the communities uh, can do. And I do believe, I always believe that policy is one thing, which I really want to do, and the uh, action item I took down that I, we have your approval that uh, the three of us will uh, create uh, a draft together with uh, uh, Ben, uh, you know, about uh, climate change and heritage. Um, our uh, uh, job is also to reach out to Kiel and find out really what is the specific about your, your theme and how can we help in regard to climate change. So it's action uh, item number two. And action item number three is basically um, talking offline, not just the three of us, but individually with you without calling uh, a meeting about uh, writing a grant, but doing some initial work uh, and again, feeding that back to you so that at least we know uh, deadlines, structure, uh, eligibility, and all that until uh, clearly here and in the best case scenario, have even in a small group, and again, we are inclusive, not exclusive. Uh, if people write grants, it's always everybody wants to be a part, and that is what it should be. Um, uh, and so this will be definitely not a little back uh, back room uh, endeavor. Uh, this will be open, you know, so very much open, like uh, in the idea of disco. And I would also invite at some point, uh, and I hope that will work for Kiel, uh, Kenny Atchison um, um, to uh, this roundtable, um, or what if it's a roundtable or whether it's a special session to write this grant or whatever, we have to see. But have him talk about the challenges and opportunities uh, and the experiences he had uh, with Disco, okay? Because you know we can learn from people who did that on this large scale project. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Any concluding, uh, you know, comments, statements uh, from our audience or from our panelists? Because I'm sure everybody has other, you know, maybe go to other sessions or do networking. I hope you enjoyed the speed dating. Uh, uh, I tried it once and it was really like, uh, it's kind of strange, you know, you're sitting there and then somebody pops up and said, I want to talk to you, right? So, Kuchi. Yeah. yeah. This is just for your information, information that, um, that um, uh, we uh, have received a preliminary uh, request to, to hold a inter-congress in Australia in two years time which is to focus on the impact of bushfire uh, on uh, indigenous communities. But then some focus uh, would be the impact of climate change on indigenous communities across the world. So when, uh, I shall keep you informed of the progress, but uh, at some point it would be very nice to put um, some of you in touch with the organizer uh, to get some um, kind of global perspective uh, on that ground uh, to the program uh, of the Inter-Congress. And then that Inter-Congress can be dedicated to what you mentioned, climate change and then indigenous communities and heritage or something like that. They haven't decided then yet um, uh, the uh, actual uh, sort of theme of it, but um, uh, incorporating climate change themes would certainly enrich uh, the contents uh, of the Inter-Congress. So um, I, I shall keep you informed. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Are you all waiting for your networking opportunities? <laughs> <laughs> you should try it. I mean, it's, it's definitely... Uh, Okay, I now have pages of notes, uh, Caroline, uh, of this session. Thank you. And Caroline, normally, uh, um, you know, we have a, a, the best note takers ever, Aileen, you know, she's laughing. We don't need it because we have the recording, right? Mm -hmm. But if there are any notes, do please send them along and we post it. And if you have not yet signed up to be a member of the Climate Change um, 
uh, community, please do so, uh, because we can do that. Uh, then you get informed. Anything which is posted will be sent to you via email. So please, as members, go to the climate change, uh, go to the EAA community's website and sign up for the uh, climate change and uh, heritage uh, 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 list. So then you're a member and you're getting informed about everything what we have talked today. Um, let me thank everybody again. This was terrific, like always. Uh, wherever you are, or lunch, or coffee, uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, we keep you posted. You stay safe and well. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go to bed now. <laughs> no, go to the networking. It's fun. <laughs> I am be you. <laughs> bye. Well, can you stay safe and see you hopefully soon? Bye bye. 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 bye.